<laughs> we'll find out what I'm going to say. I didn't know this many people could fit in here. This is Yay. tremendous. Um, Leanne Brown is going to introduce. I just wanted to say thank you for coming and thank you to Al Fillerese and his Penn Sound, U Penn, Kelly Writers House, Mod Po, Empire for <laughs> <laughs> coming along. Um, thank you. Thanks, Kate, and Ooh, thanks, Al and crew. Oh. And thank you everybody for coming. This is like a really special occasion because as many of you know, I went to Brown undergrad and grad school and then C.D. Wright matched me, Laney and me and I got to hang out with um, Rosemary and Keith and C.D. and Forrest and everybody, Michael Harper. And it was just, it's just a real homecoming for me to be here. And um, it's especially poetic to have the homage text of Laney on the new book from Tinder Buttons. Um, I, I want to read a little bit of a thing I wrote about it by way of introduction. Um, and before I forget, I want to thank um, Cole Swinson and Monica De La Torre and Elizabeth Robinson for the blurbs. You can look on the book for that. Um, and Keith Waldrop for the beautiful cover collage. Um, here in garments worn by Lindens, Lainey Brown begins a project that she terms an homage text for the poet Rosemary Waldrop. All titles which appear in italics above each brief prose poem are taken from Waldrop's book, Lawn of Excluded Middle, originally published by Tinder Buttons Press in 1993. As Brown's sequence progresses, echoes of Waldrop's text occur throughout the poem with slight alternations. These prose poems investigate gender, perception, personhood, and language, as well as permissions to invoke and explore all excluded middles. In this way, Brown rewrites, responds, and refigures the material of language in much the same way Waldrop works with Wittgenstein's sentences, making them utterly new in the way only a poet can. In Lawn of Excluded Middle, Rosemary Waldrop writes poetry, an alternate, less linear logic. Here, Laney Brown weaves an intricate intertextual poem of associational praise into a new practice and a new form. So please welcome Laney Brown and Rosemary Waldrop. <laughs> Thank you. I want to say it's a wonderful thing if work of yours uh, sparks another <laughs> work. This is uh, just a, an incredible experience and takes it uh, into something completely different. You know. So um, I am really very happy about this. And I'm going to read three poems from Lawn of Excluded Middle and then it's all Lainey. <laughs> So, when I say I believe that women have a soul and that its substance contains two carbon rings, the picture in the foreground makes it difficult to find its application back where the corridors get lost in ritual sacrifice and hidden bleeding. But the four points of the compass are equal on the lawn of the excluded middle their full maturity of meaning takes time, the way you eat a fish, morsel by morsel, off the bone. Something that can be held in the mouth, deeply, like darkness by someone blind, or the empty space I place at the center of each poem to allow penetration. I was worried about the gap, sorry, I worried about the gap between expression and intent, afraid the world might see a fluorescent advertisement where I meant to show a face. Mm -hmm. Sincerity is no help once we admit to the lies we tell on nocturnal occasions, even in the solitude of our own heart, wishcraft slanting this naked figure from Sorry, from need to seduce to fear of possession. Far better to cultivate the gap itself with its high grass for privacy and reference gone astray. Never mind that it's not philosophy, but raw, but raw electrons jumping from orbit to orbit to, re to ready the pit for the orchestra. 
Scrap meanings amplifying the succession of green perspectives, moist fissures, spasms on the lips. Last one. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I wanted to settle down on a surface, a map perhaps, where my nearsightedness might help me see the facts. But grammar is deep. Even so it only describes, it submerges the mind in a maelstrom without discernible bottom the dimensions of possible swirling over the fixed edge of nothingness, like looking into blue eyes all the way through to the blue sky, without even a cloud bank or flock of birds to cling to. What are we searching behind the words? As if a body of information could not also bruise? It is the skeleton that holds on longest to its native land. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. Danda. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much to Leanne, and thank you so much to Rosemary, and everyone for being here, and Maud, Poe, and Kate, and Rusty for opening their home. Um, and I'm writing a series of books for the women poet who made me. And it feels appropriate to say that there's one for CD right coming. Um, and I feel like these work that is most important with, to us, we're always in conversation with it. And so this is just a way to make that a little bit more visible, I think, in how this, how this book is working. And Leanne already introduced it so well, so I won't say more. When I say that women have a soul, I return to her extracts, subliminal guides, whether the menstruum is perfectly transparent or tinted, one thought wraps arms and legs around another, sinewy tinctures and malformed abbreviations stand in for an inability to represent depths. We teach our bodies to stroll, inventing solace in the gaze of another. We teach thought to unfold and in tumbling retrieved the unexpected. Strained through muslin, an uncanny aftertaste, hint of tannins inflected with the moonlight. Her sentences were patterns intrinsically in scent. They lent meaning to those ensconced nearby, a network of tunnels one could intuit or travel, and yet the only way to inhabit them was to enter your own fathoming or particular bloodstream. Even if a woman sits at a loom, slowly I learned that to pull her sentences apart was also to pull apart individual bodies. One had to learn them in relation. A sequence of words placed in one's mouth become more intimate with familiarity. The charge deepens in texture. Skin beneath the surface <clears throat> swells red. Her words suffuse my articulations until my tongue became that animal whose thirst betrayed a preference for complication. How might I transcribe thought when meaning itself is another sort of well, the original place of meeting? We carry our vessels and return to the source. between expression and intent. I found that my promises counterbalanced themselves against each other, like children, one displaced, rude or sullen, the other preening pale wings, and then the reverse, as if exchanging costumes. 
a pout for silver linings, a slammed door or sealed mouth for affectionate gestures, lifting heavy objects, cleaning up after oneself and others naturally and without complaint. The minute a behavior vanishes, the memory of its accompanying mood is gone as well, as if one were never quiet, domineering, or perplexed, as if every day were seamless and the sky kept opening to sunlight. Sudden thought is fleet, barefoot, without a care. By the time you find yourself meadowed, you are equal to minuscule globes of pollen in air. Wishcraft slanting the naked figure. I read your messages, lightly tinted with sap and wood, and now am no longer alone. A few simple words graze my lips, light votives. You cup with your hand and turn your back on the larger light, descending to protect a tiny flame. We close our eyes to conceive of discretion. A bright center of attention may be interpreted as warmth or may singe. I can't pretend I am alone when nearby me a child, no longer a child, no longer requires my presence. Ghosts of Grammar In order to be revealed, something First must be hidden. Layers were invisible, then binding, and finally trailed off into simple loops and pliable flourishes. I listened to her words as she spoke very close to the edges of soluble perception. Fingers flew along roads lined with fabric, along certain sad drenched songs. Her voice resounded in double register, prepared to receive red dye. First, I was a grown woman, then a creature steeped in milk, a she molded or sculpted. Where doubt had once lain was now a visible passage to breathing volumes, cloth maidens. I met her earlier register in myself, a very pale page. Can I walk in your sleep? Meeting earlier selves makes me shiver. What if your books hadn't been placed in my passage? What if I didn't recognize your words, which guided me toward a latent pause I only now begin to understand? In the bodily lexicon, weft comes before arrival, waits against bloom. Which thread did she ring, remote, as if each decade were a map, a middle way, Along the journey, the dark wood repeats itself between expression and consent, and books written in drowned sentences. Which origin of lace does she hear as she works at the broom in garments worn by lindens? Or bone with sentence structure. So I'm going. So I'm gone. You are the flower I address, umbra slanting the naked trigger. I loved you more than my name. So the shadow, so you danced. So I leapt into the flexed decade and then the vexed. This being all that ahead substance of once had been. I loved you more than symptoms, synonyms, or categories of midnight a shadow fell onto the tree, but the shadow was still surrounded by flight. You may travel alone, yet be accompanied by my good wishes. Neither in nor out, not here or anywhere one could give a name. I press my face close to the lettering for so long I've become unrecognizable even to my outer selves. They push and cluster like the loneliness of someone nearby we cannot ignore, yet is no longer with us. Bone with sentence rupture. For a red curve to smile, it needs a mouth around it.
When you move your lips, words penetrate deeply into your mouth, then further into your chest. No longer willing to meet, a word with one syllable remains suspended, yet meaning is not an object which can be stolen or locked away in the nonsense of lungs. <clears throat> A crowning mirage or a question. On the endless green slopes of doing nothing, mother of all nomadic propositions, does fire contain substance? Colors confide. Blue, smooth by iron. Red, ephemera, straight or tinctured. Yellow, piano plenty. No machinery is involved. The air smelled of sheep live craters of indigo, twist threads, inscribe words stroke by stroke, even after crowning departure, clearly the journey would mean growing bolder. Look up, inside the narrow staircase, vertiginous effect. If you can't see the names, look harder into the boiling cauldron in which you stand. The book occurs over months and years, bent over a horizontally placed womb. To warp the arrow. Maybe patience is the only middle pressed between leaves of a book. When nothing is bearable, not nearly grown cinema, not hiding loss behind doors, not failing at giving up, when you don't wish to go anywhere with anyone, when you don't go even handedly, make that sentence your pivot or the first in a series of abandonments. When the medium of turning has nowhere to turn, no letters to purge, nothing breakable, what becomes your system of pleasure when you don't desire elsewhere, when you are uncomfortable with endlessness, so the remedy is to amend personhood. How? You struck a match on my attention. What was inside or cascading down the body? A waning power, undressing sentences to find nothing beneath our future bodies not yet formed. Walk with me toward that other nothingness, the one which is all promise, the one in which nothing is forbidden, no chalice, no hand, and every invocation unbound. Hidden bleeding. Paste place in a jar as remedy. You will not feel well unless having walked miracles. The unwritten does not calm you. Do I misinterpret all chemical leanings? Whether arduous or effortless, I'll be anaphora, the sacred geometry of a fastening nomenclature. Though you take a strong dose, verse revises musical lungs. I only have this once, to leave earth and fly to heavens, and will not be contained. Thanks.